this is the view from where we parked last night. I'm gonna show you how to crack an egg. Yeah, that is. <laughs> Thanks for helping, Spence. Today is day 1443 of us living the van life lifestyle. We are a family of three traveling through Utah right now, heading to warmer climates. We're currently outside of St. George, Utah at a BLM land where there's a lot of people riding their ATVs and motorbikes. Um, it was a really quiet place for us to camp last night. Uh, we didn't hear any cars or anything like that. And the view here is just gorgeous. Are you cleaning the ground? <laughs> These guys are having so much fun driving the ATVs out. We're already done with our morning routine and we're just gonna let Spencer play for a little bit before he needs to take his nap and then we're gonna make the drive. Do you want a mango, Spencer? Yeah? Is that gonna make you feel better? Yeah, no, mommy, hurry go. Let's have a little mango, okay? Oh, no, I know you're hurting. I'm sorry, bud. Spencer did a little face plant riding his bike. He got a little scratched up. You all right, buddy? Feel a little bit better, buddy? Cool. All right, we're leaving St. George now. We're going to drive over to Kanab, Utah. It's about an hour and a half away. And Spencer's ready. He fell asleep. into Arizona. Fun little fact, Arizona doesn't follow daylight savings. The people of Arizona wants the winter time to have a little bit more daylight because it's not as hot as the summer so that they can conduct more business. One of the best things about van life is that we have access to the bathroom at any time. I mean I just went to the back. I don't really know much about Kanab, but I heard of it. I know there's some good hikes around and the landscape here is really beautiful. And that there's some really nice camping opportunity too. So we're gonna visit the visitor center to try to find out a little bit more to see what there is to do here. It's a really pretty town. There's a lot of uh, red rocks in front of us in the backdrop. All right, we're arriving at the visitor center, but it's been a quick stop at Wendy's. While Spencer is still napping, we're going to drive over to a gas station that has a fresh water fill. We're going to top off our fresh water tank before we uh, go into the visitor center. Alright, let me check here. Yeah, I see it. Yeah, right over here. There's a spigot. Right, let me check it out. Let's make sure there's water. Yep, there it goes. All right, here's the overflow. We are full. Good to go. Spencer just woke from his nap. We're going to drive back over to the visitor center now. It talks about like the um, surrounding 
That's what there is to be. You can have canyons. Let's see. Yeah, they got the uh, last bar stamp here. Well, I get an email or you get a notification or different layers of the monuments. All right, we just got back to the van. We're gonna do a little planning on where we're gonna go today and tomorrow. All right, so let me show you guys what we are planning. So right now we are here in Kanab Visitor Center. And one of the places that I wanted to visit is the Vermilion Cliffs. And from the, in the Vermilion Cliffs National Monument, there are some slot canyons that I wanna check out. Primarily the Buckskin and Wire Pass. But after speaking with the ranger, they, he told us that there's a whole section of the slot canyon itself that's uh, knee deep to waist deep in water. Um, as soon as, like, I think after 100 yards of going into it. Um, so we're thinking we're not going to do it. It's going to be like a, the same situation where last time I couldn't cross because the, the water was too deep. Um, so I might pass on this slot canyon today or tomorrow. Um, there's another section that if we go further down into the Vermilion Cliffs into Arizona, there are these, um, these cliffs here called the Maze where we'll see petroglyphs uh, on the wall that we can check out. This could be a cool area to see. Um, and we didn't want to really drive too far. He gave some recommendation to go towards um, Ordville which is like another 40 miles or so uh, uh, north. And um, also the Paria town site, I think it's somewhere over here. The toadstool also could be a good one too. I think there's some uh, hoodoos that we can check out. So we would have to kind of make that drive. Something that I just did now is I submitted the lottery for a very, very famous hike called the Wave, which is also located within the Vermilion Cliffs here. Um, somewhere down, somewhere over here. Um, but the the chances of getting that lottery is very very slim. We've uh, we've submitted the lottery uh, a few years ago and several times, and we weren't able to get it. Um, but I submitted it again just now for the next day. If we were to win the lottery, then we would be going on the hike tomorrow. However. If we do win the lottery, we have to go to the office to actually pick up the lottery, which will be in the Kanab area right here. So if we were to come here today, all the way down to the, the Vermilion Cliffs, and if we win the lottery, then we have to drive. This is probably like an hour drive back to the town. So what I'm thinking tonight is we're gonna just stay around this area. If we get lucky and get the lottery, then we will be able to go on the wave tomorrow. It's like a six point ish mile hike round trip, but it's one of the most amazing and rare opportunity to to hike. Um, so we'll see if we get that. And and so the plan is gonna be for tonight to stay at a BLM land somewhere around here in Hog Canyon. Um, I saw on iOverlander, there's a few sites here that looks pretty good. And um, if we get the lottery tomorrow at 8 a.m. or so we have to come back into town to, to pick it pick it up so we won't be too far away um, so that's the plan for now we're gonna head over to the campground or, or BLM land uh, shortly and we'll just relax there for the remainder of the night all right we're heading over to the BLM site now it is nine minutes away from town I want to pick up a bundle of wood so we can do a little campfire Right, we're getting two bundles. We're turning onto Hog Canyon. Yeah, you can probably park here, but it's there's gonna be a lot of road noises. Let's keep going. It's just a uh, half a mile. Oh, there's a there's a van here. Let me see if I can. Right, let me go. Let me, yes. let me find another spot. That spot that I found is already taken by somebody else, so we're gonna keep driving along this road. There should be other spots here. Right, there's no one here, so we can park over here. It's like a big parking area. Not really great views, but it's 
still a good spot. Yes. We're gonna stay right over here. Does it feel flat? Yeah. Yeah, okay. All right, let's check out the site, Spence. Okay. All right, we're gonna be sleeping here for the night. I got some firewood, but there's no fire pit here. I mean, there's a little one here. Maybe I can start a fire here. What do you think? I mean, so some people had uh, started a fire here previously. Maybe not. Maybe I'll just save the wood. But here it is. I mean, decent, pretty decent site. The site seems pretty level. We got some views of the cliffs here, which is pretty cool. That side's pretty, really pretty. I think we're gonna have a really quiet night here. I don't think anyone's coming by. All right, cool site. We can play around outside a little bit. You want to? Yeah, let's go play outside a little bit. Yeah, Spence, you got Elmo. Some people have asked us why we chose to go with a van versus an RV or a trailer. Um, and I can share with you guys our story on how we got started doing van life. So this all started in 2020 during COVID. Rena, Rena and I, we were working remotely. Um, I have a business that I can run remotely and Rena was working uh, for a health insurance company remotely. And uh, we were watching a TV show called Tiny Homes on Netflix. And at that time, we had no, no knowledge on van life, no intentions of even doing van life. And while watching that show, we were kind of uh, interested and intrigued how those people can live in such a small space. And, um, and we were intrigued about how they designed it to make it very efficient. And that's one thing about me is like I like the efficiencies of um, like a smaller space. And... Um, Sometimes these ho these tiny homes are just really smart. They made it really um, really smart to live in, and um, so that was that. And then later on, a few months later, we started watching van life content on YouTube. I don't know how we uh, how it got recommended to us, but uh, we were just watching a few of these van life verse. Uh, Sarah and Alex James was one of them. Um, they were showing people how to build vans and even at that time we didn't think that we would even consider doing van life but as we watch more and more of those videos we were interested to see how people were uh, designing the vans to be what they wanted to be and so Rena and I would just have conversations and say hey if we were to have a van like how would we design it how would we make that space functional and we would actually draw sketches just just for fun right and that kind of started the idea implanted in in our minds that um if we have a space of our own that could be something that we could do um but it was still not in our reality of living the van life um, but as we watch more and we talk about it more, um, we we kind of said something to the lines of, hey, maybe in the future we can do some sort of van life um, and just have a van that we can travel in. Seems like it's a very efficient way to, to travel, right? You have basically a tiny home with you that you can um, you take anywhere in the country. Um, and so we kind of just left it at that. But then one day in July, I got a Facebook ad showing a Mercedes Sprinter van. So it was a Mercedes dealership running that ad. And the ad was for a Mercedes Sprinter van, high top, for uh, a 2019 with 0% interest financed. And that was like, hmm, it kind of, it might make sense if we could finance this thing, right? And um, And the caveat to that is, when we were watching these videos, we even talked about if we were to build a van, like how long it would take us to build it. And um, watching some of these YouTubers, there are a few other guys that we saw, like basically talk about the build, right? Um, some people say it takes two to three months, some longer. And I'd figure, hey, if I were to do it, I would probably take about three months to do it, um, given my schedule and my, my flexibility. And so... Going back to the ad that we saw, the other caveat to what what they were selling were three months delay payments. So meaning we don't have to make a payments until uh, December. I think it was December. Um, so that I took that as a sign, and we were just like, 
what a coincidence. Zero percent financing and three months no payments. That's exactly the amount of time that I need to build a van. And um, the zero financing is really enticing, actually. You know, if you're not paying for paying interest, it saves a lot. You're just paying the principal. And so we were like, all right, let's just go take a look at the van in, in New Jersey. We were, at, uh, we were in New Jersey at that time. And um, we decided that was uh, that was the van that we were going to get. Um, we didn't really consider any other vans. Um, the vans, there were really three that people build uh, using for van life. There's the Mercedes Sprinters, there's the Ford Transit, and then there's, uh, I believe, the, the yeah, the the Ram Promaster as well. And there's also the Nissan one. Um, but we just think that the Mercedes look really sexy. It just It's just a higher quality uh, car or van. So we went with the Mercedes. But let's go back to why we went with the van versus an RV. I mean, an RV wasn't even a consideration for us um, because we never really wanted to be associated with RVs um, just because of the aesthetics of it and the size. Uh, what we liked the most about being in a van and even when we were kind of deciding is um, the the freedom that this lifestyle can give us, right? Uh, during COVID, we were doing everything remotely. So we were just saying, why not just do what we do somewhere super nice, right? Somewhere out in nature. As long as we have internet, then we can, we can do what we need to do um, anywhere. And so uh, the van was really the choice. Um, and going back to the freedom aspect of it, right? Um, the van allows us to basically go anywhere a car is. Um, we haven't had any issues with uh, parking, um, even in shopping areas or malls, anywhere that you, you can imagine parking a car, you can park this van. I mean, there's some places that are a little bit smaller where our van will stick out, but in general, I would say 99% of the places that we go to, no issue parking a van. Um, so that's the big fact, the biggest factor I would say is the ability to go anywhere. If you're driving an RV, there's a lot of places that is restricted, right? Um, you can't park in the city, you can't go into, um, uh, a lot of these smaller areas, um, usually they're bigger, they're longer. And when I'm talking about RVs, I'm talking about like the Cruise America type RVs, right? They're the, they're the bulky, obvious RVs. They do have like the Winnebago's and the, um, uh, what's the other, uh, other brand? Um, Airstream that, that makes RVs out of vans. But when I'm referring to RVs, I'm talking about like the, the obvious ones, right? And so, um, that was kind of out of the question for us is to drive something that we can't use it on a day to day basis. Um, I think of two places that we were able to go with our van where I know an RV wouldn't be able to go. One is Arcadia's Cadillac Mountain. I think there's a length restriction. Our van is 23 feet. So we were just right at the, the cusp of um, making that length. So, and they, they, they say no RVs, right? And the cool thing is like, we can identify as an RV if we want to or identify as a camper. And because we're not really an official RV, so we can just say this is just a camper van, right? And so um, that kind of lets us get away with some of the things. Um, and then the other place that there was a restriction that I know of is uh, Chaiso's Basin in Big Bend National Park. There's a 22 feet restriction. I think it's because of the windy road and um, and the wind, high wind. So they, they restrict a certain uh, length to uh, any vehicle driving down to Chaiso's Basin. All in all, the mobility of it, the uh, ability to go everywhere is the reason why we chose a van. Um, it's just pretty flexible. Um, and and what we love the most is the, the idea that we can do stealth camping. Um, and we've done that a ton, right? When we're in a big city, we even stealth camped in New York City, right? Right in the heart of New York City. Uh, we've done it in LA, Denver, any big cities, there's cars we just blend right in and the stealth factor, right? Um, if you don't know how a camper van is supposed to look with the solar panels, you really don't know what this is, right? For the most part, right? People are kind of ca catching on to it, but um, a camper van like this, the way that we designed it is designed to be as stealthy as possible so we don't get disturbed at night or uh, people don't don't mess with it at all. And we luckily we haven't had any issues with um, people messing with it or getting a knock on, letting telling us to leave. Uh, we've been sort of um, 
cautious and careful with that. Um, yeah, that the idea of freedom, right? Be able to go anywhere we want and uh, park anywhere, see anywhere, um, see anything or go anywhere a car can go. I mean, there's a lot of places that we still can't go, uh, like places where it requires four-wheel drive, high clearance. This isn't this isn't high clearance, and this is only two-wheel drive. So we're but but this van is able to take us to I would say majority of the places that um, the country has to offer. Um, later on, if we want to go to the the back roads and off roads, then that would be for reserved for another vehicle. So I just want to share with you guys kind of an insight as to how we got started and why we chose this van. Um, and if you guys want to know more about why this van versus a ProMaster versus a Ford Transit, uh, we can kind of go into some of the specifics that we like about this van uh, versus others. Another thing about choosing this van, uh, a cargo van from scratch and building it ourselves, designing it and building it ourselves, is that we wanted to first design a van that is super functional for what we need. If you guys seen our van or a van tour before, um, you'll notice that there's a lot of cabinets and there's a lot of um, uh, things put together that are, in in my opinion, pretty smart and well designed. Um, we actually have a full time lapse of the entire build in our YouTube channel, so you guys can check that out. Um, and that's part of the van life experience, in my opinion, is the build, right? We were able to build it and it took us three months exactly. And it was a really satisfying process. And the day that we moved in, we felt very accomplished that we were able to do this together and um, build something of our own. Uh, and that we can actually enjoy for, I mean, we're still enjoying it now. So very rewarding to be able to do that. And the design aspect of it and the coloring was picked specifically for, uh, for, for it to feel homey, right? We want to build a tiny home, not just, uh, you know, somewhere to live on the wheel, which in our opinion, that's what an RV would kind of serve as. Um, I mean, there's probably pretty smart designs for RVs nowadays, but, um, uh, but we wanted to make it something of our own and this is what it is. I think with me talking about the van and why we chose it, um, that's going to take up most of this video. So I'm going to end the video here. We're going to just relax ourselves and enjoy this uh, beautiful, quiet site. I mean, I hear echoes. I mean, I hear it ringing in my ear. It's so quiet here. Um, so if you guys like watching real van life content, be sure to check out uh, our video tomorrow. Hit that like and subscribe button. And uh, we'll see you guys on tomorrow's video. Bye.